and welcome to the fourth annual Public Policy Conference of the Ontario Centre for Engineering and Public Policy. My name is Bernard Ennis and I am the Director of the Centre and the Director of Policy and Professional Affairs at Professional Engineers Ontario. Uh, before we get started, I have an announcement. Um, those people who are registered for the PEO Annual General Meeting, uh, when you registered at the front, uh, you were not provided with the, the package for the AGM, so at some time during the day, would you please go to the re reception desk and uh, pick up the AGM package? <clears throat> um, this year, there was a change with, um, with the center. It was moved from being an independent body into becoming a department of PEO. One of the other things that happened was that uh, the Centre uh, Council asked for an advisory body for the Centre, and it is my pleasure now to introduce the members of the uh, board, for, the advisory board for the Ontario Centre for Engineering and Public Policy. First of all, uh, and if you could stand uh, and let everybody see where, who you are. Um, first of all, our board chair is Mary Carter of Engineers Canada. The vice chair is Professor Brian Surgener of Queen's University. Uh, the members of the board are Ken Klump, Klump from RCMP, Gary Thompson from Toronto Hydro, I guess he's not here yet, and our EIT representative is Charcy Cyril. There are two other members of the board who could not be here today, uh, William DeAngelis, representing Consulting Engineers Ontario, and our media representative is Bob McDonald from CBC, who will be receiving the President's Award from Professional Engineers Ontario at tonight's honor, Order of Honor Gala. Um, you'll notice on the slides um, throughout the day, you'll notice th the sponsors for the various segments of the conference. Uh, our sponsors this year are Engineers Canada, who are the overall conference sponsor. The University of Waterloo is the breakfast sponsor. The Canadian Institute of Steel Construction is sponsoring today's lunch. Consulting Engineers Ontario is sponsoring the breaks. And the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Toronto is the media sponsor. Please, yes, thank you. Please extend a gracious thank you to them all. This year's theme, Changing Expectations, reflects OSEP's objectives of redefining the way in which engineers are engaged in decision-making processes, protect, particularly those leading to public policies. In many organizations, there are two career ladders, one for leaders and one for the technologically inclined. Probably the best example of this division is found in the famous line uttered during the argument about whether the Space Shuttle Challenger was ready to launch. At the height of that argument, the general manager of Morton the Theatol, the manufacturer of the solid booster rockets, told the vice president of engineering to, quote, take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat, unquote. The implication is that important decisions the decisions about what has to be done are not made by engineers. Too often, engineers are regarded solely as implementers whose task is to create and utilize technology to suit business, decision, business plans and political choices made by others. By providing forums such as this conference, our policy engagement seminar series, and the articles published in Engineering Dimensions, OSEP encourages engineers to demonstrate to decision makers in government, commercial enterprises, and civil society organizations the strategic value of engaging engineers in fundamental policy decisions. I hope you will take the opportunity of, of the question periods today to become part of those dialogues. And if you have a Twitter account, don't be shy about tweeting some of today's ideas and discussions to your friends. At this time, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Janusz Kaczynski. Dr. Kaczynski was appointed Dean 
of the Faculty of Science and Engineering at York University in July 2010. Born and raised in Poland, Janis received his PhD in Energy and Environmental Engineering from the University of Science and Technology in Krakow. After professional, uh, sorry, after postdoctoral training at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Janis joined McGill University in 1994 and was appointed Associate Vice Principal, Research and International Relations in 2005. In 2006, he was named International Chair in Bioenergy for the Institute for Advanced Studies and the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in France. Prior to joining York University, Janus served as Dean for the College of Engineering at the University of Saskatchewan. He has also completed the prestigious Oxford Advanced Management and Leadership Program at, York Uni at Oxford University and the Executive Education Program on Crisis Leadership in Higher Education at Harvard University. His research includes projects related to sustainable energy systems, the next generation of nuclear, nuclear reactors, environmental impact of energy technology, greenhouse gas mitigation, fabrication of novel nanomaterials, public security in buildings immune to bioterrorism, and Mars exploration. Tying some of these research in interests together during his work in Europe, Janos went on a series of zero-gravity parabolic flights. Janos also has experience outside academ academia. He has founded his own energy company and consults with multinational firms around the world. He has also served on the board of a number of companies in Canada and US, including the position of chairman. Please welcome Dean Kaczynski. Ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Bernard, thank you so much for inviting me and for such a kind uh, introdu introduction. <clears throat> um, it is, I, I understand now why I'm invited here, because uh, uh, the subject of my talk, which is the Renaissance engineer, it fits uh, very nicely into what, what you mentioned that is the main topic of our discussions. Uh, and he is the changing expectations. There are changing e expectations in many <clears throat> different professions, but perhaps um, engineering is uh, unlike many other uh, professions that, that uh, is uh, evolving uh, dramatically. And in fact, what's really good about it is that uh, there's evolution, so to speak, or perhaps to a degree a revolution is, is driven by uh, the current young generation of engineers um, and uh, there's particular responsibility on, on uh, the part of us in academia to make sure that we will be able to recognize those new needs and that we will be able to uh, respond to it. Well, uh, I've been uh, living in Toronto for uh, not even two years and uh, when I look around I see a lot of friends um, if, uh, that I've made with the engineering uh, community, and perhaps so because uh, I, I'm, I have the pleasure of leading uh, a unique project at York University, uh, the project that focuses on uh, uh, creating the next generation of Renaissance engineers, and I wanted to share it with, uh, um, with you. Now, uh, just uh, to, in order to put everything in, in the context, so to speak, uh, the, those of you who didn't know much about York, it is uh, the third largest university in Canada. Um, more than 50,000 students, uh, uh, but, but the predominantly York uh, had been known, or still is known, uh, for strengths in uh, humanities, social sciences, rather, and, and uh, business as well, law. Uh, not necessarily in, in my own field of engineering. So um, uh, just, a, just a two years ago, before I came to York, uh, we've made a decision that uh, there will be a substantial, and in fact, for academia, dramatic investment in science and engineering, particularly 
in engineering. So uh, what I wanted to do today is give you uh, a, a glimpse of where we are with this Renaissance engineering uh, project, but also where we're going. What is the pathway that we are uh, undertaking? And I'm very much interested in, in comments and uh, uh, the critique, uh, perhaps, um, in order for us to make sure that we're going to undertake an optimal uh, way. The only way to do so is to, um, is, is to uh, build this new type of engineering by consensus, because our students will be working with you. Um, and uh, this rather so sooner rather than later. So we want to make sure that, that you understand our intentions and vice versa, that what we do uh, is, is reflecting uh, your needs. Now, uh, let me begin with this statement, which I like, which is true that, that what's in the past, it, it, it helped shape us as we are uh, today. But it doesn't, but you, you're not going to build the future based exclusively on, on uh, traditions and your history. Uh, we are truly responsible for um, who we want to be or what we want this profession of engineering to be. Um, and that is exactly what we, um, what, what we set to, to do. Now, um, in, like in many different uh, uh, aspects of, of life, there, there, are a lot, there are a lot of uh, perceptions that uh, uh, drive uh, our opinions. Um, so, um, and it is the same thing with engineering, and it is the same thing with, uh, uh, with, with uh, what we do every day. So let me, let me just uh, quiz you. Some of you had an opportunity to listen to my talk just a few days ago at OSPI. So you, the, the, those of you who know the answers to the quiz, please don't share it with your, with your colleagues. Now, uh, so let me ask you a question. Look, there, there is a, what, what would you have invested in this group of individuals if they came to your office with a good idea? Well, uh, um, if you did, uh, that, that would be a terrific decision to, to make. This is a uh, Microsoft team with uh, Bill Gates right there on the left-hand side in a blue shirt. So it's a perception that you may, uh, that, that you have, um, and then you, perhaps you would act based on the perception rather than uh, anything else. Now let me, uh, let me ask another, an, an, another question. Uh, look, if you, would you let these people run your country? Well, typical, perhaps the answer would be no, but uh, uh, Brits did, and uh, this is uh, Tony Blair, a former prime minister, here together with his uh, colleagues, and several of them were ministers in his uh, Labour government. So uh, <laughs> what, it, what it tells you is that uh, just a first uh, uh, instant of looking at things, not necessarily is, uh, is the best to make your um, uh, informative decisions. That, that's what we decided to do. Is it's, it doesn't really matter uh, how you look, uh, what, what you do, it, what matters. Um, what matters is uh, the power of ideas that you have. In fact, ideas are critical in order to make things happen in any field, but particularly in, in my own field, uh, uh, in, in academia and, uh, and engineering. Now, if you look at the engineer, how the profession had changed, uh, what, what I decided to do is, is, is just uh, categorize it, so to speak, in three different ways. Back in two centuries ago, 19th century, essentially th this is where uh, the uh, profession of an engineer was uh, created and where our profession uh, s stood uh, um, uh, separate from others and it became essentially a distinct profession, but in the 20th century it changed dramatically, and it changed because of uh, the very close link that was established between 
uh, engineering and science. One of the uh, most successful uh, projects of, uh, um, of linking engineering and science was uh, the Manhattan Project. Uh, so uh, al al although some may question the moral values of, of uh, the project, if, if you will, uh, but from, from the technical point of view, scientific and, and engineering point of view, it was, it was a, terrific, um, a terrific achievement, and it did change the way how um, an engineering was perceived. Now, in the in current century, it is all changing dramatically. It is changing between, because of, of the, the current generation of uh, um, new young minds that are not afraid of uh, working with anybody on anything and trying to solve everything. Now, that is the concept that, uh, that we are uh, embracing. At, at York, truly. So that's what <clears throat> that's what we uh, decided to do. We decided to create uh, an engineering <clears throat> school <clears throat> that truly is going to uh, respond to to uh, to this uh, um, new calling. Now, uh, if you are um, going to to make a, a change, it's not very easy. You know that uh, the the only person that really likes change is a baby with a wet nappy. You see, people don't like it. And, and you have to, if you're making a change, you have to realize uh, that there will be a variety of characters that, that you will be working with. Um, and and uh, the, the way to do so is, as always, um, via consensus. You have to convince people to embrace ideas that you have, and vice versa. You have to be open-minded um, to uh, uh, the ideas of, uh, of others. Now, in, in, this, in the current century, uh, when I look at the driving forces uh, in engineering, by, by the way, in science as well, there are six of them. And so innovation is certainly, uh, and, and collaboration. Transdisciplinarity is what I call transdisciplinarity. It's not just a uh, interdisciplinary interaction on campus between on, uh, between the uh, uh, engineering and and, uh, and science and business and law and so on. It is also uh, going outside campus and partnership with uh, with industry, partnership with uh, with government, with business community and so on. Uh, the international uh, partnerships are becoming absolutely critical. In fact, one of the key pillars. Uh, of our project is, is the international partnership. Uh, recognizing diversity and variety of, of uh, options is important, and um, competitiveness is, 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 is true as well. Uh, sometimes my colleagues uh, uh, at, at York, they, they, they don't like uh, uh, when I say that, that we, are, we must be competitive. I mean, we are all competitive. It's, it's a healthy competition. There's nothing wrong about healthy competition. So uh, uh, on one side, being collaborative and competitive, as long as we will be able to, uh, um, uh, to, to create a balance between these two activities, um, that, that will be um, very, very good in, indeed, in my opinion. Now, <coughs> so this is how I see the, how engineering is changing in the, in the 21st century. It's truly becoming different. We are not anymore uh, individuals solving problems uh, somewhere in the, in the corner uh, or in the desk in the office. We are all over the, uh, uh, the, 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 the we're all over many facets of, of uh, life in a society. So we are truly becoming and embracing the, this team-based uh, leadership. Now, it is very important to, to, to see that we are, um, that, that um, the, it is ne necessary for engineers to be a truly well-balanced. What I mean by well-balanced, it means that we have to understand the world a little bit better in order to offer solutions to uh, its uh, problems. And um, it, in our case, what we really want to do is, to, and we are going to, uh, to, to, to do so, we're going to uh, initiate a gender parity 
uh, ambition or aspiration um, for our programs. It is very important to be open to uh, uh, this uh, undertapped source of engineering talent to uh, and, and uh, embrace and uh, accept more female students in uh, in academia. This is uh, in engineering particularly. Uh, it's very, very important. And we have to realize that the way how students are currently learning things is totally different. It's not anymore uh, uh, this kind of gathering that you have uh, one speaker and then or one lecturer and then you have uh, uh, 400 students uh, in a classroom. This is not going to work anymore. Uh, no, this is not going to work well anymore. There are different ways of, uh, um, of, of passing knowledge on to uh, the young generation. And I will, I will explain what uh, our solutions are to, to this. Now, so uh, our solution is uh, uh, relatively simple, in, in fact, although it flips a lot of things about the current perception of engineering. Now, if you change anything, and in order to be meaningful, and in order to work, one of the, uh, in, in addition to having good ideas, in addition to having a terrific group of people that will be working with you implementing these ideas, uh, one thing that is always necessary is money. I mean, it's as simple as that. You won't be able to do too many things if you don't have it. In, in our case, it's a big project. $250 million investment um, over some period of time is substantial. Now, what, so what we are doing, and in fact, we will be making a formal announcement very soon, is as of July 1 this year, we're going to have a new faculty of engineering. It will be called a La Sonde. School of Engineering at York um, University uh, that will be leading this $250 million investment over some period of time. What does it mean? Well, uh, by the way, so uh, the story is following. We, we've, uh, um, we had some good ideas and we went to talk to uh, Pierre Lasson. Pierre Lasson, he is the chairman of uh, Franco Nevada um, uh, Corporation. It is uh, one of the biggest gold mining corporations, and, and he's a, a, a friend with Simur Schulig, who is very well known uh, in, in many uh, corners in Canada, because he, and uh, also on campuses, because he created, so to speak, a, a virtual university. He has this tendency of investing uh, in only one field, uh, in uh, in a particular city. So uh, if he invested, as he did, in a business school, Schulich School of Business at, uh, uh, in Toronto, he, he would never invest again in Toronto. So then he invested in uh, a music, faculty of music at McGill University in Montreal. He would never invest again in, uh, in Montreal. Uh, and, and so on. So he, he created this, this wonderful uh, virtual university and, and he helped us convince Pierre that, that those ideas that we had uh, were very good and it was not easy because uh, Pierre is the graduate of uh, Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, so it's, uh, there's always a natural tendency to support uh, your own alma mater. Um, and he did and he does. Um, but uh, the biggest investment that he had made was this $25 million to establish the Lasson School of Engineering at York, which we announced last November. The university matched his $25 million. Uh, and then provincial government matched it all. So we, sat, we suddenly had $100 million, and then we went to the federal government to match it, uh, the, the other 100 and, uh, and, and we hope that soon we will be able to, uh, to share some good news with you. So this school is truly becoming a, uh, um, a, a reality. So we, we are um, creating several different uh, units. Uh, it's not perhaps as important to, to mention them, but uh, the scope of the project is following. We're going to grow a student number up to 2,000 and then cap it at that level. 
So, uh, by, so we will be growing by uh, around maybe 1,500 within, uh, within very few years. We're going to hire 110 new colleagues, 70 new professors, and, uh, and, uh, around, and 40 technical staff and administrative staff. So it's a dramatic, dramatic uh, hiring exercise. And uh, if you want to do something new, it's much easier to do it if you, have, if you have an opportunity to build it bottom up and hire new generation of people that want to work with you on uh, the ideas that you have. I mean, it's much more difficult to, uh, to, to change things if you have a well-established um, uh, faculty. I, I was a member of a faculty of engineering at McGill University for 16 years. A terrific engineering school, no doubt. But if we wanted to change one course or add one course, it would, have, it would take very, very long time because everybody was afraid that one is infringing on, on one's uh, uh, field and then and, and the students will go to this course rather than that course. I mean, it, it was very, very political.